Great. <laughs> We're good. Welcome, welcome. We're going to give a few moments for folks to tune in here. Um, and while everybody's coming in, just make yourselves at home and we'll get started here momentarily. Welcome, everybody. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, we're just going to give one more moment and uh, we'll get started here in just a second. I'm going to just give it one more minute. I'm going to do a quick check of my email and just make sure I don't have any last minute stragglers trying to get into the meeting. Looks like we're good. All right, I think we're going to go ahead and get started. Um, hello, and thank you so much for coming to the Friends of the Chatham Public Library's author and artist talk with Chatham Brewing founder Tom Crowell. If we haven't met yet, my name is Jen McCreary, and I'm the new director here at the library. Um, sorry we're the, that we're not meeting in person today, but we're excited to have so many people joining us via Zoom, and we hope that you'll come and visit us at the library here again soon. Um, this is the second in our series of author and artist talks sponsored by the Friends of the Library. You can find out more information about how to get involved with the Friends and all of the library's upcoming programs on our website, so please do check that out at chathampubliclibrary.org. Um, just a few quick housekeeping things. Um, if you're new to the Zoom webinar format, um, we are going to have a Q&A at the end of this program, um, and at the bottom of the screen you'll see a Q&A box where you can type in your questions. Um, or there's also an option to raise your hand if you'd like to be invited up on the screen to ask your question live and in person. Um, and without further ado, I'm going to introduce Friends board member Sarah McWilliams, who's been instrumental in arranging for today's program. Thank you so much, Sarah. She's going to be introducing this afternoon's speaker. Great. Thanks so much, Jen. It's wonderful to have you all here today, and I'm delighted to welcome Tom Kroll as our speaker. Tom is a co-founder, co-owner of the Chatham, uh, Chatham Brewing LLC in Chatham, New York. Uh, founded the brewery back in January 2007, uh, I believe in a garage in an alley behind Main Street. So we're excited to hear Tom tell us uh, the story of how they got from there to where they are now. Tom's career has included more than 20 years in positions of increasing responsibility at the Columbia Land Conservancy. He was with the Conservancy until December 2019. Prior to founding Chatham Brewing, Tom also was founder of Harvest Spirits, worked with them for several years, and Harvest was an early uh, participant in the movement of using local agriculture products uh, to produce uh, distilled spirits. Tom's academic background includes a bachelor's from Middlebury College and a master of environmental planning from University of Virginia. So Tom, delighted to have you here and I'm gonna turn the video and the audio over to you. Great, thanks so much. Welcome everybody. Thank you for joining on a Saturday afternoon. I'm going to uh, share a screen and run through a little bit of background on the brewery, and um, then we'll have time for questions and answers um, afterwards. So, all right. Um, so, yeah, Sarah said uh, Chatham Brewing was, we founded uh, back in 2007, uh, myself, Chris Barone, and uh, Jake Cunningham. And now I have to stop nope. that goes. Um, many of you will remember sort of the good old days in the in the back alley when we had to sell uh, growlers uh, on Saturdays. We would open up for growler hours. We were down behind what's now Goodness Cafe. Uh, at that point, the state law has only permitted um, off-premise sales, meaning we could sell the growlers, but we couldn't have a formal tasting room like we do now. Uh, so we'd put out a sandwich board sign out on Main Street, directing people down the alley. 
and then we would have uh, three or four different styles of beer available for people to come and fill up the growlers and take home with them. Um, we served our first legal beers in February of 2007 at the, the what is now the People's Pub. Then it was the Pint of Guru, uh, owned by Tom Hope. Uh, so that's myself and Jake looking considerably younger uh, than we do now. But um, right from the start, we've always had great community support in Chatham and throughout uh, Columbia County uh, with most of the restaurants in town with liquor licenses. Uh, offering our beers for sale. And in fact, the little um, Sitco gas station down in the corner of 203 is our, our number one seller of cans uh, to this date throughout, uh, throughout the counties that we, we serve. Um, this is Christmas Eve of 2016 when we literally moved down Main Street to uh, our present location. Uh, Ron Davis uh, picked up our brewery that now sits in the front windows facing Main Street and drove it uh, down Main Street to the new location that uh, most people are familiar with today, 59 Main Street. Um, the building was originally built as an A&P market and was a mini chopper and the Chatham market and various other things for, for quite a while uh, until we moved in uh, in 2016. Um, when we moved in, we brought in a much much larger production tanks into the space. Uh, we had to lower the floor three feet in the back in order to fit the tanks in. Um, we were pleasantly surprised to uncover the great old tin ceilings that were there hidden underneath a, a drop ceiling. Um, but it took, it took us uh, close to a year to, to build the space out um, and get to our present operation. Uh, this is the the current brewing system um, we have now, it's a, a, what's called a 20 barrel system. A barrel of beer is measured by 31 and a half gallons. Uh, so this will do about 600 uh, some barrels in a batch. Um, <clears throat> you can see the white tube coming across the top that brings grain in from a mill, drops it into that funnel, which goes into the mash tun. And uh, we'll talk a little bit more about the process later. Then the vessel on the left is the kettle. The vessel on the far right is basically a large hot water uh, storage tank for doing the, the brewing that we do here on Main Street. All of our beer we make right there on, on Main Street. Uh, we're really happy with the way the tasting around front has become a, a real centerpiece of the community for gathering for people for sports, um, dinner, family occasions. Uh, we'll have the occasional uh, candidate for elected office who will come and speak. Um, we've hosted uh, both of our US senators, our congressmen, our state and local representatives, town board members of all held forums here. So we really like the, uh, the fact that it's become sort of a, a go-to gathering place. Uh, and people will come and watch whether it's World Cup or Olympics or um, we had great uh, turnout when the U.S. soccer team was playing both men's and women's. Uh, so it's, it's really uh, fun to see people come together for all different occasions. We've, and last year, we were able to figure out how to live stream the local high school sports, which you know weren't allowing in-person viewing, but uh, we were able to figure out how to live stream those on our TV. Um, a little bit about for the craft brewing industry as a whole. It's grown enormously. If you look at that little bottom line graph, you can see the steady progression up. When we opened in 2007, there were about 55 breweries in New York State. Today, there's over 460. This is last year's number, and I think it's up, up over 500 now. Um, you can see statewide, it has a pretty significant um, amount of uh, economic impact. Um, I think we're now number two in the country in terms of number of breweries. Uh, there's three breweries per person, given the population of New York City, which puts us uh, 31st nationwide for number of breweries, but it's still um, a, a definitely a growing industry in New York State. And in fact, here in Columbia County, uh, according to the Brewers Association, there's now eight 
uh, entities with brewers licenses. I don't think they're all in production at the moment. I think there's one or two breweries in planning that's represented in that number, but uh, this is a 2018 census that was done that counted 113 jobs created by the breweries with an overall economic impact of $47 million, uh, which I think, you know, it's a pretty mind blowing number. I think that includes both direct sales and indirect uh, benefits in terms of tourism dollars, um, contractors, other, uh, other employment opportunities out there. But I mean, in terms of the tourism dollars, we definitely see it with our, in our tasting room. And you see a lot of cars with Massachusetts and Connecticut, New Jersey license plates. We get a lot of people down from the capital region coming in the main street. A lot of, you know, sort of beer tourism has become a very popular uh, thing. There's, we're part of something called the Capital Calf Craft Beverage Trail, which has 50 some producers with a stamp passport book. Uh, so people go around and try and collect all their stamps. So that brings people into town. And, you know, once they get here, they'll come visit us and then stroll up and down Main Street. And uh, people are always impressed by how many independent stores there are on Main Street and the great variety. Um, so it's, it's uh, you know, that's another thing we like. We like our Main Street location, even though we're tight for space sometimes. Uh, we like being right there on, on Main Street and being part of, part of what's happening. Um, so as I said, you know, obviously we're a brewery, we produce beer, uh, which the German purity laws say the beer should be produced just from malt, hops, and water with yeast added. Um, you give that a little time and you end up with beer. So uh, when we refer to malt, we're usually talking about barley. Uh, this is the uh, Stonehouse Farms down in Livingston. They when David Rockefeller Sr. passed away, the farm was in process of transitioning to more organic crops. Uh, they had been growing a lot of corn for cattle feed. Uh, and the next generation side, they wanted to go more organic. So one of the things they've been focusing on is uh, barley and rye for the production of beer. Um, so as I said, mostly when we talk about malt, we're talking about malted barley. Barley is the grain. Uh, malting is a process where you take the seed and start it to germinate. Uh, traditionally, this is done on a flat floor uh, where it'll be warm and wet, and that'll start the seed germinating, which starts a process converting the starches in the grain into sugars. And at that point, it's stopped and then roasted. Um, you can think of it sort of like coffee where you have light roasts and dark roasts, and those different roasts will give... Uh, the beer, the finished beer, it's different colors. Um, like I said, we use predominantly barley, but there's also, uh, you know, obviously wheat beers have wheat. Uh, Farmer's Daughter, which is our top seller, uses rye, which is grown down in Ancrum. Uh, same farms that are producing rye for Hill Rock Distilling's rye whiskey. Um, and so New York State uh, in 2016, part of their uh, expansion of the brewing industry was to grant what they call farm brewing licenses. These allow producers who are using a high percentage of New York state grown crops in their products, certain advantages on the markets. And the idea was to also encourage the farm side, the agricultural side to start growing these crops. Uh, they got a lot of support from Cornell to figure out which varieties of barley and hops would grow best uh, throughout New York state. So much of New York State's grain production is further west down towards the Finger Lakes, um, but there are people doing it uh, right here in the Hudson Valley and, and Columbia County. Um, hops are the other major component of beer. Uh, on the right there, that little pine cone is the hop flower, uh, and it contains um, something called lupulin, which looks sort of like pollen. It's a yellow, powdery, oily dust, and that's what gives the hops both aroma and bitterness. Um, it grows on these tall vines, they're called, on the left where they run wires down from poles. There's some trellises. They used to be on Highbridge Road. I think they're no longer there and some others up on uh, Bunker Hill Road north of North Chatham uh, where people are growing, uh, growing hops. Um, New York State used to be one of the major producers of both hops and barley until Prohibition 
knocked it out and sort of simultaneously there was a blight. Both crops are very sensitive to molds and funguses. So the damp, cold Northeast climate makes it a challenge for growers. Uh, so after prohibition rules were lifted, a lot of these crops shifted to the arid parts of the Pacific Northwest, uh, sort of uh, Eastern Washington state where they can just irrigate the roots and don't have so much rain and uh, moisture in the air. So it avoids a lot of the leaf rusts and funguses that were affecting it. Um, so most of the hops we use are in the pellet form at the bottom there. You can see it looks like a little pellet you might feed a rabbit or a gerbil. Um, they're just crushed up, compressed hops that uh, dissolve nicely in the, in the kettle. Uh, whereas the whole hop cones, you can see, can be more challenging with uh, moving through with plumbing and stuff. Um, every fall, sort of right before Labor Day, we do a hop picking party at the brewery to make our hop crop IPA. We um, have a couple, uh, Jeff Risley, who's got the frame shop on Park Row, who's been supplying us with hops. He grows over in the Helderbergs, and we put them out on big, long tables in the parking lot and give people buckets and scissors, and they clip the little cones and we'll harvest a couple hundred pounds uh, in the afternoon and those end up going into the hop crop IPA, uh, which, is, which is really fun. People really enjoy being involved in the process. Um, as I mentioned earlier, so, so you take the malted barley on the right and you put it in the mash tun where you're steeping it in 150 degree water. This is pulling out the sugars out of the grain. Um, and it'll steep in there for roughly an hour. Um, and there's a false bottom screen, kind of like you'd see on a French press coffee pot. Uh, but instead of pressing down to get the liquid out, the screen is at the bottom and you spray hot water and open a valve and allow the liquid to drain out the bottom. Uh, and it gets pumped over to the kettle on the other side of the brewery uh, where it's brought to a boil. And that's when you add the hops, uh, when you add hops, in the boil phase, you're mostly getting the bitters, um, bittering components out. And if you add them later on in the process, you'll get more of the aromatic oils, uh, which has become increasingly popular in styles like IPAs. Um, then you add yeast. Yeast is a micro, microorganism that converts the sugar in the mash into alcohol. And as a byproduct, it's putting off carbon dioxide. So this is a a hose coming out of one of the fermentation tanks that's put in a five gallon pail and the foam and bubbling is as a result of the fermentation that's going on inside the fermenter. Uh, it'll do a very vigorous fermentation for the first few days and then it'll slow down. Most of our beers are ales which ferment at room temperature fairly quickly um, in you know 10 days time or so. Lagers are the other main class of beers. Those are done at a, a cold, colder temperature, you know, less than 50 degrees um, and typically take a little longer. Those tend to be more of the German styles like Pilsners and Oktoberfest, Marzens. Um, so after it finishes fermenting, um, we'll often do this as Matt Perry, our, our brewer. He's adding an addition of hops uh, with IPAs. It's become very popular to they call it dry hop or even double dry hop, adding two additions where you're adding the hops to the fermenter uh, at room temperature. And you're not getting any bitterness, you're just getting the more floral aromas off the hops. Um, you know, reading the description of these hops is it's like when you go into a wine store and you hear all these fantastic descriptions. Of, they'll talk about, you know, tropical fruits, mangoes, uh, coconut essences of strawberry and summer melon. Um, so part of the, the art of brewing is deciding the different combination of hops you want to use to achieve the desired flavor profile. So we'll have a lot of <clears throat> base hops. Cascade is one of the sort of fundamental hops. It's a very citrusy hop. And then we'll add uh, these different hops from around the country and around the world to the beers to achieve uh, the different flavors. So the IPAs tend to be the most hop forward beers, whereas the a style like a porter would be more on the malt, sort of sweeter, more robust side with less of a hop presence, more just a, a base uh, bittering hop behind it. Uh, so after the beers ferment out, we package them either in cans, growlers, or 
kegs heading out to the consumers. We still self-distribute. New York State allows for breweries to do direct distribution. Some states do not allow that, and you have to go through a third-party distributor. We like <clears throat> to maintain the customer service and control, so we've got two delivery vans that are out uh, three to four days a week going from uh, Saratoga, Glens Falls, south, we pretty much go one county either side of the Hudson River, all the way down to Orange and Westchester County. Uh, so I think it's about 11 counties altogether that we're in. Um, and we have something over 200 active accounts that we're distributing to uh, throughout throughout the Hudson Valley. Um, we do the canning right on site, which uh, last year and the year before was a real lifesaver when restaurants shut down people obviously weren't buying kegs weren't having draft beer but the can sales were still pretty brisk so we we're fortunate to have our own uh, canning line in the back of the brewery um, so over on the far right if you look closely you can see some skinny metal probes those go into the can and fill the can with uh, co2 displacing any oxygen uh, carbon dioxide is heavier than air so you can purge the can of as much oxygen as possible because oxidized beer will give it a shorter shelf life uh, and off flavors. Then the two white probes go down, fill the can with uh, cold carbonated beer. Um, in order for a liquid to be carbonated, it has to be cold. So it's just down around 35, 37 degrees Fahrenheit to hold more of the dissolved um, CO2 in the beer. Uh, and then you can see the foamed up cans there. They're heading over to get a lid dropped on, which then gets uh, crimped and sealed and labeled. Uh, people often, you know, ask us, "Oh, you know, do you have any? I'm traveling. Do you have any cans that aren't refrigerated because I don't want to warm them up and put them back?" But the fact of the matter is, all beer that you buy, whether it's in the grocery store on the warm shelf or out of the refrigerator, starts out its life in the can as cold. Um, we keep all of our beer cold because it creates a longer shelf life, and we don't pasteurize it. Uh, in our case, and many craft breweries don't pasteurize it. It keeps the beer alive and more flavorful, we feel. Uh, but it also means you need to treat it with, with care. So we, we do try and keep it refrigerated as much as possible. Um, our cans, we buy blank. They go through the canning line and end up getting uh, labeled and, and sent out. We usually have about half a dozen plus styles of cans available. Uh, throughout the year, they rotate seasonally. Uh, our core brands, of course, are the Farmer's Daughter, the Norista IPA, and the Checkered Pass Pilsner. Those are always uh, available. And then other styles rotate seasonally, Oktoberfest in the fall, the porters and stouts in the cooler months, in the summer months, we have things like raspberry wheat and uh, other lighter, lighter flavors that sort of match people's tastes as seasons change. Um, like I said, we, we and then at the tap room, we have 14 different styles on tap at any one time. Uh, they range from ales to lagers to sours. Most beers are classified as either an ale or a lager, and that's determined by the strain of yeast you're using. As I said earlier, an ale yeast ferments uh, basically at room temperature. Ales tend to have a sort of uh, fruitier flavor profile to them. It's uh, and more typical of, of British style beers traditionally, um, whereas a, a lager ferments colder, like I said before, around, you know, 40 degrees uh, longer and has a cleaner, drier profile. So your Pilsners and Marzins and Oktoberfest will be uh, lager beers. Um, but the color profile, you know, people tend to think of ales or dark and lagers are light, but that's not necessarily the case. It's, it's the yeast. So you can have a, up until you add the yeast, the beer could be either one. And you can, there are definitely dark lagers, like a Schwartz beer, a German dark lager. Uh, and then there's very light golden, golden ales um, out there. So the, the color isn't so much the determination as the yeast itself. And then you've got other uh, yeast, Belgian strains that have very distinctive flavors, um, clove, banana, uh, Hefeweizen, which is a German wheat beer, has a, a yeast that's very cloudy and murky and it gives a strong uh, banana clove 
flavor to the to the beer. Uh, so there's a lot of variety in the yeasts as well. Uh, a lot of sort of trend in using in doing sour or wild fermentation beers now. Sours use a lacto fermentation process uh, similar to sauerkraut. Um, same uh, lactobacillus organi organism that gives it that heart acidic taste. And because it has that uh, lower pH, more acidic, uh, that's why we don't can it. The cans have a epoxy liner that uh, don't always hold up as well to the, the pH of the more acidic beers. Um, so we have those sours on, on tap. Um, and, um, you know, it's definitely a, a learned flavor profile. Not everybody goes for them, but uh, for those who do, they're, they're uh, definitely a, a cult favorite. Um, and then the other thing you hear a lot about are wild fermentations. These are literally where they're just opening up open tanks and letting uh, wild yeasts inoculate the beer and ferment. Uh, you see this over in Belgium a lot. They have these louvered doors that open and big flat fermenters that look like swimming pools. Um, so it's a whole different theory than like our brewery is very sterile, clean, all enclosed, trying to keep out anything. Um, but these Lambic beers go the other way and, and use wild fermentation. We had a guy, a local guy, who was trying to cultivate some wild yeast that he captured from around and sort of clone them up uh, and develop them. But um, not sure whatever happened to him. That never quite came to fruition. But um, the thing earlier, you know, we, we take pride of being part of the community. We're active with the... Um, the Chatham Business Alliance and their festivals, Oktoberfest being the, the big one and uh, Summerfest. Um, we try and do a lot of fundraisers for different organizations at the brewery and help out when we can with donations. Um, the Farmer's Daughter Gravel Grinder is another big signature event. This year was held up at PS21 and will be again uh, this coming spring. It attracts 800 riders uh, from around the world. Uh, we had um, the top finishers this year were some of the top riders in the world. Uh, they did the 68 mile course in uh, just a little under three hours, um, which is pretty amazing. Most people take six to eight hours uh, and probably only half actually end up riding the whole course. It's quite rigorous, but it's really uh, grown to put uh, Chatham on the map as being one of the destinations for dirt road uh, cycling. Um, a couple of years ago, we were really fun doing a, a custom label with uh, uh, John Mason artwork for the village's sesquicentennial 150th anniversary uh, doing the spear, which was a great limited edition thing that was um, a couple of years back. It was fun. Uh, so like I said, but we enjoy doing these um, custom special run beers for different events. Um, we did one just recently with uh, WDSC out of Woodstock for a CD release party they were having. But unfortunately, it was the night of uh, last week's ice storm, so it ended up getting canceled. But because um, it's something fun to do, so uh, you know. So with that, we just you know appreciate everybody's great support of uh, enjoying to drink local, and um, I will join you now and take questions. I think. Uh... Thank you so much, Tom. That was fantastic. I feel like I learned a lot about the process of making beer, and it seems like something that would be really fun to nerd out about. And I can also attest to Chatham Brewing's um, role as a community institution, um, because as a recent transplant to Chatham, a friend said the first place that I should go was the brewery, just to connect to the community. So. I can speak to that. Um, and we do have some questions coming in. And if you, again, I would just invite people if you have questions to put them in the Q&A box. Um, and we've got somebody who's asking if you can address the sustainability issues in the brewing industry. Talk a little bit about that. Sure, yeah. Um, you know, we're fortunate on the East Coast to be um, in a fairly wet environment where water is less of an issue than out west. Out west with the droughts, uh, there are several large national breweries that had to actually cut back production uh, last summer due to, due to the droughts. Uh, beer is a very water intensive uh, process. It takes about seven gallons of water to make one gallon of beer. Um, so we do what we can to 
reduce our impact. Um, for instance, when you go from the boiling kettle side over the, to the fermenters, you use a, a water chilled heat exchanger to cool the beer from boiling down to room temperature. Uh, and so what you're doing is you're putting cold water on through this device on one side and the hot beer on the other. And what you get out is cool beer and hot water. And so rather than just running that hot water down the drain, we capture it in one of those large storage tanks to use for the next batch of beer. Uh, we got a nice sort of grant a few years back to do a solar um, hot water array on the roof of our building. Uh, you can't really see it from Main Street, but it's up there. And we have a 750 gallon tank um, in the basement that's, that's fed by the solar panels on the roof. Um, all of our spent grains go out to uh, local farms. We have, I think, four different farmers now that are picking up. The majority of it goes to Trowbridge Farm. Um, there's a nice sort of little closed loop cycle there. They feed it to their beef cattle. Uh, and then we in turn buy the beef back to serve uh, the, for the burgers and, and other beef we're using in the tap room. Um, we side stream the yeast out of the bottom of the tanks uh, that also now is going to Trowbridge uh, to use on their fields and um, supplement uh, for livestock it has a lot of vitamin B's in it. Uh, so it can be a good uh, nutritional supplement. Um, and the local sewer department doesn't, doesn't like it with their uh, digesters it can throw the balance off there. Uh, we do a lot of recycling. Um, you know, the trend recently has been to move away from glass bottles uh, to aluminum. Um, that was primarily done because the aluminum is more sustainable than, or more uh, favorable to, to beer. Uh, beer is photosensitive. Hops, if they get exposed to sunlight, will skunk a beer. You've heard that term. It'll turn it, turn it sour. So that's why aluminum cans are more preferable. They don't break, uh, but they're also more, also easily recycled um, as well. Uh, and there's, there's a lot of talk within the Brewers Associations about ways to make um, brewing more, more sustainable. Um, sounds like you guys have taken a lot of steps in that direction. Um, another oh. question is, how did you, uh, sorry, one second, how did you learn to brew? Um, I started out home brewing, as did uh, Matt, our, who's our, our main brewer now. We have two full-time brewers at the brewery. Um, Growing up, my parents used to make wine and things at home in the basement and root beer. Um, and then uh, in college, friends and I started started home brewing, and that uh, translated over. The first brewery I worked for was was in Brooklyn, um, and uh, I'd given my home brew to somebody who said, "Oh, you got to meet our friend who's opening up a brewery here," and that's sort of how I got into the commercial side of the brewing world. But like a lot of people, you start with home brewing. There's some great homebrew stores, including the one up in East Greenbush uh, that give advice and, and help people out with that. Awesome. I have a, a home-based question here from my local beer tourist um, who wondered uh, how you name the beers. Do you have like a, a resident pun, pun master or <laughs> to yeah, take we do a, a few beers? Of a lot of, a lot of brainstorming and kicking it around between uh, a bunch of us to sort of come up come up with names and it's getting harder and harder now with you know like I said, we went from 50 breweries in New York to close to 500 now and that number has gone from uh, 1500 to I think 8000 nationwide so coming up with a, a beer pond that nobody else has used is is pretty hard um, uh, in fact coming up with any of the names these days are pretty hard and you see a lot of breweries now that are there the name of the beer is almost like a full sentence, you know, like murky hypothesis 402, you know, like <laughs> that name comes from, what does that mean? But um, so yeah, it's, it's a fun process of kicking the names around and seeing what, what works, what we can use. Um, the label designs, we use uh, Jordan Wolf who lives up in Old Chatham. He does most of our, our labels. Um, so, you know, again, we try and work with as many local vendors as we can on things. That's great. Um, if anybody else has questions, if you'd like to ask them live, feel free to raise your hand and I'd be happy to invite you up on screen. Um, and just speaking of the number of breweries in the state, I mean, even in the last year, I feel like we've seen a lot of breweries open and also close. 
Um, and I just, I, you guys have been around for 10 years. Is that right? Uh, it'll be 15 this year. 15 years. Um, so do you have like, what do you think is the staying power of Chatham Brewing over? Yeah, places? I mean, we started through a couple of peaks and booms in the, in the cycle. Um, and it happens, uh, Brewers Association tracks. And I think once again, we're getting close to the point where openings and closings are happening at about the same rate. Although I do think there was a net growth in breweries last year, which was amazing given everything else that was going on. You'd still see new businesses. I think there's two, possibly three new breweries planned for Hudson that are in the works. Uh, so it's definitely still happening um, and still still opening. And yeah, when we first opened, there was um, Keegan's Brewing down in Kingston, uh, Neil Evans with the Albany Pump Station, and Brown's Brewing up in Troy. And we were like, oh, do you think there's really room for, you know, another brewery in this part of the Hudson Valley? And, you know, of course, now you can hardly drive 10 miles without running into another brewery. Um, and lots of places have multiple breweries, uh, Albany, I can't even count how many are now in Albany. Um, so definitely it's, you know, shifted from the model of trying to grow and be more of a regional presence to staying pretty local and pretty focused with the taproom model becoming increasingly important to the sort of economic viability of relying on the, you know, your hometown customer base. Uh, we definitely see our, our sales are much easier the closer we are to home. And as we push out to about an hour away, that's where it becomes much harder because you just sort of lose that grassroots name recognition and hometown spirit you have. Uh, and, you know, the definition of local has gotten much smaller now or, you know, it used to be, oh, sure, we're local, we're two hours away. And now it's, you know, we're five miles away or something is, is the local circle <laughs> definition. Super local. Um, here we got another question in the Q&A. Uh, I really like stouts and porters. What is the difference between the two and what does and what makes them so delicious? Also, yours are really good. <laughs> yeah, our, our uh, Spike Devil Porter was actually the very first beer we brewed and released. Um, and that's a recipe we haven't haven't changed from those early days. Uh, so, yeah, uh, we appreciate that. Um, the difference between stout and porters is always heavily debated as to whether there even is a difference or whether, you know, some people say a stout is derived from being a stout porter. Um, you know, they're both dark ales or both ales. Uh, they use heavily roasted malts. Um, porters tend to have a lot of uh, chocolate malts in them. Um, and uh, stouts, a, you know, a dry Irish stout will have a, a roasted barley that will give it a little more astringent, um, dry finish. Um, interestingly, uh, a lot of people wonder, you know, do they, are they higher alcohol, more calories? Um, not necessarily the case. Guinness stout uh, is relatively low in alcohol, four and a half percent, and and relatively low in calories. Uh, the color darkness doesn't equate to more sugars. It's just uh, more heavily roasted uh, malts and barleys. Um, and, uh, you know, so, but you can have, you know, we have a, we also do some, what they call them, imperial stouts. We mean, you're basically doubling up the amount of grain that's going into the beer. So producing a higher alcohol um, product up around eight, eight and a half percent instead of four and a half, five and a half percent. Um, so those, you know, that's something you want to watch for the percentage alcohols because it's definitely, definitely more than sort of the uh, mass market beers, which tend to be about, you know, four and a half to five and a half percent. Um, so the craft brews definitely want to be aware of that, that the alcohol percentage does make a difference. You're making me really want a beer, Tom. Like <laughs> have to go. Good, good. Yeah, we're open, open now. <laughs> And you're open six days a week, is that right, Monday? We are, yeah. Every day but Tuesday, we do lunch Wednesday through Sunday. Mondays, we open up at 4 o'clock. Um, and like I said, we're closed Tuesday. Um, you now, our food program has grown over the years. When we first opened up the uh, tap room, we thought we could get away with just a small, basically, like, hot dog cart and have – well, first, we didn't really want to do any – 
cooked food at all. We thought, you know, chips and peanuts and that sort of thing would be sufficient. Uh, and then we realized that people would stay longer. If we had food, they would have one or two beers and then say, all right, I've got to go get a pizza or go somewhere else for dinner or go home for dinner. Uh, so we had added food and, um, and uh, I think it's been about three years now. We've had Zach Russell, who used to be out of, at Wonder Bar, doing our, our food for us. Um, we have an external kitchen in the it's like a, a mobile, although it's not really mobile, uh, food truck uh, that has a full-size kitchen in it because uh, there isn't really room in the building to cook. Um, and he uses a lot of local ingredients when he can, like I mentioned, the Trowbridge beef and, and seasoned uh, greens and vegetables uh, and tries to keep usually change the menu up seasonally keeping favorites in stock and then this year's been a challenge with the supply chain shortages uh things like chicken wings have gone through the roof uh, in terms of pricing and it's always uh, a juggling act to see what you can find um, to keep keep the kitchen running and keep the costs uh affordable that's something that's been important to us is keeping our prices down uh, as much as we can to keep um keep our, our place accessible and i think it works because we see a lot of a lot of families and um you know we're not just catering to the, the high-end uh crowd i think that's definitely appreciated um and it makes you more of a local friendly place which is really important you know, it's been a, and you know it's been a challenge especially in our supply chain issues with aluminum cans uh, over the last few years became very tight in demand as um People were staying home and it's the same cans that are used for soft drinks and seltzers and the appearance of hard seltzers on the market consumed a lot of the cans. So there's definitely a supply chain crunch. Uh, at one point we had cans that came in and they were stamped as having come from Dubai. Uh, <laughs> you know, so it's just one of those head scratchers that are caught in the global supply chain. But we, so it's, that has definitely kept us on our toes the last uh, year and a half or so. I bet. Um, my last question for you is in reference to the chicken wings, and that is, do you have any special plans for the Super Bowl tomorrow? Or are you guys going to be screening it, or are you? Um, we'll be open at least through the first half. We have found that we don't really get a crowd that warrants staying open for the whole thing, but we are doing Super Bowl to-go specials uh, on our website. You can order wings and nacho platters um, to take home. So price goes down the more wings you buy the cheaper they become <laughs> bill can't really get below a dollar a wing right now whereas two years ago they're 25 cents yeah it's uh, it's amazing how expensive chicken wings have gotten but yes we do have a wing special going on and uh, i'll get the nacho platters as well to go and uh, we'll be open you know it's also valentine's day on monday so we're running a valentine's special uh throughout the weekend figuring not a lot of people would Fewer people might be inclined to go out on a Monday night than they would on a weekend night. So we'll have uh, a surf and turf for two starting tonight, running through nice. the weekend as well. Nice. Well, I hope you get a lot of folks there from this call. And we really, again, I have to thank you for taking the time on a beautiful Saturday afternoon yeah, no. to talk to the I'll library and tune in. And, and we'll definitely see you at the brewery, the brewery here soon. That's good. All right. Thank Thanks so again. Much. Bye. Thank <laughs> you.